100. Now, that's one way we can do this, 300 divided by big boxes. But there's another way to measure heart rate using the EKG, and it's based on something I mentioned a second ago. This entire rhythm strip should be about 10 seconds in duration. And if I know that this entire thing is 10 seconds in duration, then if I count the number of beats that I have in here and then multiply that by six, then I should have the number of beats in 60 seconds. So the other thing we can do is count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and multiply it by six. Now that's strange because I end up getting a heart rate of 78 there which was not the same thing as I said with our big box rule. And the reason for that is because it turns out there are irregular intervals on here. If you really pay attention to the rhythm that we have here, there's a big space between these two QRS complexes and a small space between these guys. If there's not a regular rhythm, I can't really base the rate on two beats because the distance between the beats is always changing. So if you have a patient who has a fib or some kind of other irregular rhythm, then using the big box rule fails and we can't use that shortcut. In that case, we have to utilize the entire rhythm strip in order to measure how many beats we have in 10 seconds and then extrapolate that to assume how many beats we would have in 60 seconds. So two mechanisms by which we can measure rate by looking at a rhythm strip. And I'll emphasize too, that typically you will only end up getting one strip as your image in a USMLE style question it would be rare to see a full 12 lead EKG, but we'll be proceeding as though we need to read a full 12 lead EKG just in case for many of our questions tonight. Anything to add to that about rate, Moses, before we move on? No, I think you covered that really nicely. And it's a perfect segue actually to talk about the rhythm. Um, and so I, I wanna start the conversation around rhythm by just defining terms. So what we mean by rhythm is, are the tracings that we see on the EKG reflective of normal electrical conduction through the anatomy of the heart as one would expect in a healthy heart? Or are there problems um, or other abnormalities either from where the electrical activity starts or how it moves throughout the heart? And so, it, it would be useful, I think, to just briefly review what each of these different components of uh, a typical uh, heartbeat would look like on an EKG. The P waves, which you can see here uh, highlighted with the big bold arrows, represent atrial depolarization. Then you have the QRS complex, which represents ventricular depolarization as the electrical signals which start out in the SA node travel through the atria, they, there's a small pause, um, which we'll get to later when we talk about intervals um, at the AV node. They travel through the rapidly conducting uh, tissues, right, of the bundle of his, the Purkinje fibers. And then you have, have the depolarization of the ventricles. And then, of course, you have a reset. Both the atria and the ventricles then repolarize, the atria being far smaller in mass. You don't really get to see that super well in a 12 lead EKG. But the T wave, which comes afterwards, represents the ventricular repolarization. So being very practical here, how do we know if a, a particular EKG is reflective of sinus rhythm or normal rhythm? And the key is to look at the P waves and to look in particular at lead two, because if the initiation of a heartbeat, of a normal heartbeat starts up in the SA node, you would expect an upright P wave, a P wave pointing up in Li2. You would also expect that every P wave conducts and leads to a QRS complex, right? And that every QRS complex has a preceding P wave that led to the ventricular uh, depolarization. And then of course you would expect a normal uh, repolarization of the ventricles with a T wave. And there are so many different abnormalities of each of those particular parts of the EKG that we will go into later. But if you see those features, upright P wave in two, every QRS has a preceding P, every P is followed by a QRS and relatively normal looking T waves, that's a great clue that uh, you're dealing with sinus rhythm. Um, and in the steps to come, we'll sort of talk about how it looks like when this goes awry. Anything to add there, Joe? 
Uh, nothing really to add, just to reiterate exactly what you said before. The thing that you're gonna get pimped on on the wards is asking what constitutes a sinus rhythm. And this does play back into what you're gonna see on your exams, which is that we want a P wave for every QRS and a QRS for every P wave. And you have to say both parts of that because if you had a P wave without a QRS, then you'd have the SA node firing with no ventricular depolarization following. If you had a QRS complex without a P wave, that would mean that the ventricles have spontaneously depolarized without the say-so of the SA node firing first. And so by definition, the sinus rhythm is one in which the SA node is in control of the ventricles. And for that reason, there has to be a one-to-one -one ratio between the P waves and the QRS complexes. That's when we have a sinus rhythm. And that's going to be important for you as you're looking at the rhythm. One of the first things you want to assess when you look at that rhythm on your EKG is whether or not we have that sinus rhythm. Um, so awesome, excellently said. You want to go ahead and lead us into talking a little bit more about, uh, actually, no, I'll talk about axis next, and then I'll have you tell us about intervals. So as we're looking at axis, the thing that we're trying to determine by looking at the heart's axis is the direction of electrical activity. And our main goal here is to assess whether electrical activity is pointing where it should be. And typically, electrical activity will be pointing from the SA node down towards the apex of the heart. And so what that means as you're looking straight at your patient is that electrical activity should be moving kind of down towards the cardiac apex, down into the patient's left. That's what we would call a normal axis. Now, what could end up happening is that you could have a patient who has maybe a little bit too much left ventricular tissue. Maybe they have left ventricular hypertrophy, or maybe they have some kind of infarction on the right side of their heart or something along those lines, in which case electrical activity would favor going towards the left ventricular tissue, which means that the overall directionality of electrical flow in your heart will end up moving up and to the left as electricity turns the corner, goes to the cardiac apex, and goes into the ventricular free wall. If the left ventricle is a little bit more robust than the right ventricle, for instance, as you would see in left ventricular hypertrophy, then you would end up seeing that the electrical axis for the heart would bend and point up in what we would call left axis deviation. Alternatively, somebody who has isolated right-sided ventricular hypertrophy might end up seeing that electrical activity would bend down towards the right ventricle and kind of point down into the right for that patient. What we're getting at here then is that axis can represent for us too much electrical flow in one direction or the other, either due to interruptions in the electrical signal that makes electrical signal go in a weird direction, right bundle branch block, left bundle branch block, or alternatively because of thickening and hypertrophy of some of the tissue in the heart. Now, the way that we're going to assess our axis, which is a little complicated, is by looking at the individual leads. Each lead on the heart represents electrical activity going in one cardinal direction. In particular, the ones that we see here that are most important for us to pay attention to and the ones that will be most useful in determining our axis is looking at what lead one is doing, which usually points directly to the left, and what lead ABF is doing, which usually points straight down. So, if you look at the EKG, an upward deflection of the QRS complex typically is going to end up representing electrical activity pointing towards that lead. If I look at lead one and I see an upward QRS complex, electricity is going to the left. If, however, electricity were pointing to the patient's right, you might end up seeing a QRS complex that is downwardly deflected or has a negative deflection, in which case you would say lead one, negative deflection, electricity is going away from lead one. So when electricity goes towards lead one, positive. When electricity goes away from lead one, negative. The same thing is true for AVF. If electricity is pointing towards AVF, you would end up having a positive deflection. And if electricity were pointing away from AVF, you'd end up having a negative deflection. With that in mind, you can now determine where the axis is in the heart. Where is electricity going? merely by looking at lead one and lead ABF, because one of them represents going to the left and one of them represents going downwards. If you were to have a positive deflection in lead one and a positive deflection in lead ABF, I know that I am pointing towards lead one and I'm pointing towards lead ABF. And that means that my electrical activity must be pointing down into the left between the two, hence a normal axis. So and try to engage you guys a little bit in this for a second here. What if I were to look at my patient's EKG and I saw that the patient had a negative deflection in inverse QRS and lead ABF, but a positive deflection in lead one? 
would that be normal axis, right axis, or left axis deviation? Go ahead and type your answers into the chat box if you wouldn't mind. All right, I see some students already doing that. Thank you, everybody. Keep them coming. If you guys have a thought, we have this particular set of positive in lead one and negative in lead ABF. All right, you guys were ready to go. Thank you for answering my question, playing along by entering into the chat box here. I really appreciate it. So lots of good answers, the majority of which are saying that if we're getting a negative deflection lead AVF, that means we're pointing away from lead AVF. If we have a positive deflection lead one, that means we're pointing towards lead one, which means the directionality of our electricity is gonna be pointing in this direction, which predominantly most likely means left axis deviation. So as we can see, if we use lead one and lead ABF as our car directions, those are the only two leads that you're commonly going to need to look at on your exams in order to determine the axis of the heart if you're going to need to do that on the exam. Uh, Moses, anything to add about uh, kind of like our axis interpretation here? The only thing I would add, and it's something that actually came up in the chat, and, and you, you really said it well, Joe, that most likely if you're um, negative in ABF, but positive in one, you're dealing with left axis deviation. The image shows that there's maybe a two thirds chance or a two fifths chance that you actually end up with a, a normal axis because normal can represent up to negative 30. So, so one other trick is to look at lead two. Notice that if you're in negative in lead two, you're far more likely to be truly left axis or possibly even extreme axis deviated depending on what else is going on. Um, and so that can be a bit of a tiebreaker. So the, the two main ones to look at, just as you said, are one and AVF. If you need a tiebreaker, you can look at some of the other leads and particularly two that could, um, that could then lead to uh, help you distinguish between a left axis deviation and just uh, a slightly negative axis uh, still within the normal, normal range. Excellent point. So if we're getting really fancy here, we'll notice that lead two points down into the patient's left and if we're looking at the kind of directionality of lead two, that means that anything that's pointing down to the left will be positive for lead two. Anything that's pointing kind of up into the right-ish is going to end up being negative. Now, if I draw a line orthogonal to lead two's direction, this blue line, that means that anything that is on this side of the blue line is going to end up being negative for lead two because it's pointing in the wrong direction. And we'll notice that means that anything in the left axis deviation territory actually is on the opposite side of that orthogonal line. So Moses makes an excellent point here that left axis deviation can be quintessentially proven by looking at lead two. I will also throw in that if they do that on the exam, that's a 20% of people getting this question right style question. So it's unlikely that they'll throw it at you on the test, but that is your definitive answer in terms of what, what axis we're looking at here. So awesome. Uh, all right. Uh, in that case, now I will throw it over to you, uh, Moses, to take a look at our intervals. So how do we start paying attention to intervals once we've got rate, rhythm, and axis down? Perfect. So intervals represent the, the parts of the tracing that occur between or inclusive of the major parts of uh, one cardiac cycle, the P wave, the QRX complex, and the T wave. And we'll just take them step by step as you encounter them left to right. So the first is the PR interval. And this I think of as representing um, the delay that happens in the AV node or, or more broadly, the delay that happens between the atria and the beginning of ventricular electrical activity um, as the cardiac cycle begins. And so the normal PR interval is somewhere between 120 and 200 milliseconds. And for those who think in boxes, that's somewhere on the order of four or five small boxes. Remember each small box, 40 milliseconds, big box would be five times that, 200 milliseconds. Um, and in the chat, what type of diseases would you expect to see abnormalities in the PR interval with? Throw, throw anything you can think of, a PR interval abnormality, what, what's a type of disease that can uh, come up with that? And I'm seeing several wonderful answers. There's the broad bucket of um, bradycardias and what type of bradycardia are we dealing with? That's one place that we really think about the PR interval. And then, you know, the classic sort of delta wave, the slurred and shortened PR interval that can be seen in uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White 
WPW. So that's excellent. That's the PR interval, some of the diseases we think of with that, with that interval. The uh, next interval that we think of and that, and that I'm focusing here on the high yield intervals um, is the QRS complex. And the, the schema that I think about is very simple. There's two, there's two basically buckets for the QR, QRS. Is it narrow? Is it wide? We'll get into the details of what this matters later on. But again, a normal QRS interval is narrow, right? Less than 120 milliseconds, less than approximately three small boxes. If it's larger than that, that's a, you know, there's a whole differential diagnosis around why is the QRS broad? Is there a bundle branch block? Are we dealing with the malignant arrhythmia? We'll get into that. The next interval that's really high yield is the QT interval. Um, and this is relevant because if the Q interval gets long, either because of some congenital issue with the conduction system of the heart or other electrical metabolic abnormalities that can lead to a prolonged QT, you can end up with a dangerous arrhythmia. And this is super important for those of you who are going to be going into the wards um, because you will be prescribing really common medications that affect the, the width, the length of that, of that uh, QT interval, which normal is somewhere in the 400s. We get concerned as it gets closer to 500 and definitely after 500, that's when we start getting more and more nervous. Um, but that's something to, to pay attention to. Um, and we'll get into specific diseases in each of these categories later. I, I wanted to keep it high level at this point. Joe, anything high level that you would sort of um, mention at this point? Uh, no, I think you nailed that perfectly. I want to emphasize just again, the, the biggest thing that Moses mentioned here was the uh, interval either for the QRS duration, which can be really useful to help you identify the nature of the arrhythmia you're looking at. If you see if the QRS is bigger than small, three small boxes, that is to say. Alternatively, long QT is the one that we're really worried about with a lot of medications. And we're looking for the end of the T wave, I should emphasize, which is what our arrows are showing us here, we're measuring the QT. Uh, generally speaking, we're looking for the corrected QT, which involves a calculation, but nevertheless, as Moses mentioned, longer than 500 milliseconds is universally too long for the QT interval, and so that should be our high watermark for what we'll accept on the exam if they ever give us a duration for that. Um, keeping in mind, one big box is 200 milliseconds, so that means that two and a half big boxes uh, is going to be what we're going to measure for the QT interval there is like the upper limit of maximum. And awesome. just to All say... Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I was just, just to say this explicitly, the correction that we're doing is because um, the analysis of the QT interval varies based on the heart rate. As the heart rate gets faster, you have to correct for that. Um, there's many different formulas not worth getting into now, but that's what we're correcting for. It's correcting for the heart rate in various ways. Yeah, absolutely. I think personally, the way that I like to think about that is that I'm really worried about the end of the T wave abutting too close to the next QRS complex. And the more tachycardic the patient becomes, the sooner that next QRS complex comes down the pipe. And so as a result, we're more and more worried about a longer QT abutting into what would be ostensibly the next ventricular depolarization before we're ready to handle it. All right, uh, so let's move on to talk about morphology. Uh, which is our last one to focus on here. Morphology is kind of like the grab bag that we're going to be looking at as the last thing uh, on our EKG. Once we've established what the rate, rhythm, axis, and intervals look like, we're going to take a quick glance at the morphology, predominantly looking for only a couple of things. Number one, does the P wave look weird? Number two, does the ST segment look weird? Is there ST segment elevation? Is there ST segment depression? Number three, do the T waves look weird? And one example of that would be like peaked T waves, which is something that we're gonna see with potassium related issues. So we're just kind of like scanning around to see if anything looks weird. And we do need to kind of look at every lead for this because each lead will represent different areas of the heart. If we were to say have like myocardial infarctions or ischemia, and then each lead has kind of characteristic ways in which it demonstrates different parts of ventricular depolarization, repolarization, where it might be more noticeable that we have P wave problems in lead two, and more noticeable in other leads that we have T wave related problems. So taking a look at the morphology on this EKG, as we just kind of scan around and look at each of the leads on here, uh, can you guys tell me number one, perhaps, what is the morphological problem that we're seeing in some of our leads? And then number two, if you guys have a diagnosis for what's happening with this patient, just based on that morphology, you can go ahead and type that into chat as well. So 
What are we seeing? And what's the diagnosis? You guys can try to answer me in chat. All right, got a couple answers coming in. I'll mention as you guys are entering these, you cannot see each other's answers, but we can see all of your answers. So if it seems like you're silently entering answers into the void, you are being accompanied by other people. We just don't have you seeing each other's conversations here. So I'm seeing a lot of good answers showing us that we have ST segment elevations. And if we do, you can very clearly see that the ST segment is elevated in lead two here where we don't really have that going back down to baseline between the QRS and the T wave. You can see it in lead three as well. I can see it in AVF. Leads two, three, and AVF are classically going to be called an inferior myocardial infarction. And for all intents and purposes on the exam, that more or less means the right coronary artery is likely infarcted. And somewhere around 80% of individuals, the inferior circulation is provided by the right coronary artery. So you can stand a reason then on the exam if you have a inferior infarction, it's probably a right coronary artery, unless they outright tell you that they end up doing some kind of uh, cardiac catheterization showing left dominance to the heart. So most likely right-sided heart attack. And we caught that immediately by seeing the ST segment elevations in these different leads. I will point out that as we're looking at these EKGs, we're asking you guys to just pull the answers from them. And as we move into some more examples, that is what we're going to be doing as well. But I really need to emphasize the fact that in many cases, when you're looking at these EKGs on your exams, you're looking at them with clinical context in mind. They will tell you a person is coming in with chest pain radiating to the left arm or something along those lines to indicate they have a myocardial infarction. And then your view of the EKG is mainly to confirm your clinical diagnosis. Do they have the ST elevations I'm expecting to see? Oh, good, they do. Therefore, this probably is a heart attack like I thought it was before. So. In some cases, we do need to read the EKG directly to understand it and diagnose because we simply know they have an arrhythmia and we need to treat that or figure out what the problem is. But try to use the clinical vignette to identify what we're looking for in the first place so that we're not always blindly going into these EKGs, if at all possible. So excellent job, everybody, diagnosing our inferior MI here. Uh, so now that we've kind of talked about the rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, and morphology, Let's go ahead and start talking about what kind of pathologies we can identify here. So Moses, do you want to walk us through what tachyarrhythmias look like generally? Absolutely. So we're getting into abnormalities. And just as Joe was saying, having a very structured approach, this will really touch on rate and rhythm. Tachycardia is defined as a rate problem, and the rate is too fast. Historically, you know, a rate of 100 has been designated as the cutoff for tachycardia. Sometimes in sepsis, people talk about rates of 90 and above as being used in various criteria. But whichever cutoff you're using, the heart uh, is beating too fast. And you're seeing evidence of that on the EKG. And it's important to have an organized approach to how to think about tachycardia, both for exams and in real life on the wards. What's shown on the screen is one uh, schema for organize your thinking about this. And it's important both diagnostically, but also therapeutically, because certain wide complex tachycardias, especially if they're accompanied by other vital sign abnormalities, require essentially initiation of ACLS for unstable arrhythmias. Um, and there's, there's uh, algorithms for, for that clinically. But for the purposes of the exam, the first thing you look at is, is the QRS narrow less than 120 milliseconds, three, three boxes, little boxes, or is it wide? I'll start with discussion of a narrow complex tachycardia. You'll notice that the next branch point is talking about rhythm because if the QRS is narrow, it tells you that on some level, there's some signal coming through either from the atria or from high enough in the conduction system such that the ventricles are um, getting stimulated in a sort of synchronous fashion and leading to a narrow QRS. And the question that you ask yourself, if the QRS is narrow, is what is the rhythm, which remember is the second point on our checklist. If the rhythm is regular, it's one of a small number of things. It's either sinus tachycardia and the differential diagnosis for that is super broad, right? If, if someone just got off a 15 hour plane from um, somewhere else in the world and they're hypoxic and they're tachycardic to the 120s or 130s, just because the rhythm is normal isn't actually reassuring. I would be very concerned that this patient would have something like and in the chat, what, what would this story make you think of? 
and everyone really has that illness script really top of mind, exactly a pulmonary embolism of some sort. So just because it's sinus uh, tachycardia, in some ways it's very concerning because you have to go figure out why is their heart responding to something else going on in the body. But regardless, you can also have other types of supraventricular tachycardias. Maybe the uh, atrial activity isn't quite sinus, but it's coming somewhere else in the, um, in the atria. And there's various, you know, AVRT, AVNRT, we won't get into the details of all of that, but uh, you can have supraventricular tachycardias. And then you can also have atrial flutter, which can be regular um, depending on, you know, the, a very stable rhythm around the tricuspid annulus. Now, on the other hand, if the rhythm is irregular, I'll tell you that number one, two, three, and four is atrial fibrillation, right? By far, that's the most com common clinically. It's also the most common on the exams. The most common narrow complex irregular rhythm is atrial fibrillation. But of course, there's a differential diagnosis to this. Uh, multifocal atrial tachycardia is, is on that list, and there's an association with lung disease there. And I will, I will not discuss a flutter with variable conduction or a couple of the other like SVT with aberrancies. You know, if this was an advanced sort of electrophysiology talk, we could go into Brugada's criteria and all that other stuff. I would say it's nearly uh, unheard of for you to be needing to use that knowledge uh, on step one for sure, and even on step two. But regardless, um, we're, we're trying to be complete here. If the QRS is wide, then you are thinking that there's something, there's some problem with getting appropriate signals from the sinus node through the AV node in a timely fashion and into the QRS. That, that initial initiating event for the cardiac cycle is happening something further down. And similar to how we think about narrow complex, we're thinking about, is it regular or irregular? And if it's regular, then you're thinking of ventricular tachycardia, and then alarm bells should still be going off. Why are there in ventricular tachycardia? Is there ischemia? Is there electrolyte abnormalities, right? Um, or the uh, SVT with the Berency and all these other things that, that we won't really discuss too much further. And then an irregular wide complex tachycardia um, has the differential there. The one that um, I think is most likely to come up, honestly, is ventricular fibrillation and telling that apart from ventricular tachycardia. Um, to step back, QRS, narrow wide, what is your rhythm, regular or irregular? And then always in the back of your mind thinking, why? Why am I seeing the rhythm that I'm seeing? And that's where what Joe said is so key. What is the vignette telling you? It'll take you 90% of the way there. And the QRS is just a slam dunk on your, on your clinical reasoning as you go through a vignette. Joe, what have you got? Perfectly stated. And I'll just lead you into saying that, you know, the vignette is going to matter. So we're going to do our best as we look at some practice examples of this to incorporate a small vignette into that. So Moses, I'll toss it back to you, uh, taking a look at a couple of these tacky arrhythmias. Uh, I think we're going to ask our students like what they're seeing here. Perfect. And, and we, may, we may have uh, spoiled it a little bit, but here we have two examples. And again, we're going to take a, a structured approach. So one, is it a tachycardia? Yes. The rate is, is greater than 100. You can use the small boxes method, you know, with the rhythm strip, um, you could do the, the 300 method uh, as well. Um, the next question uh, that we mentioned for tachycardia is, is, do I, is it narrow or is it wide? And what do you all think? Is this narrow or is this wide? Right, everyone is chiming in saying wide. Um, and so this is where we get into a little bit of, uh, of a difference. What do we notice about, and, and I should just also mention going through systematically, I, I'm not really seeing P waves really in the classic sense of seeing P waves. Um, I'll skip over sort of intervals and, and some of the other elements, but just to say that the top uh, sort of pink colored lead, there's something sort of irregular about that. What diagnosis would you think of if you saw a story about someone overdosing on TCAs. Beautiful, folks are saying torsades, right? This, this uh, turning on a string uh, sort of morphology that we're seeing there. And what, what uh, medication would you give in this clinical scenario, sort of taking it more into the, the higher level of reasoning here? And we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of folks saying magnesium, exactly. Exactly, magnesium for the polymorphic sort of torsades picture. 
Now in the bottom, we get a totally different story. Maybe this is an older individual with metabolic syndrome coming in with you know, an hour of crushing substernal chest pain that radiates to the jaw and to the, and to the arms. Um, and if this is more of a pathology question, uh, they might show you an image uh, with a lot of scarring or fibrosis. What diagnosis would you think of for the bottom sort of right? Beautiful, so ventricular tachycardia, classically monomorphic ventricular tachycardias are associated uh, with ischemia, myocardial ischemia. Um, but of course you can also have electrolyte abnormalities um, and, and congenital issues that could also be um, leading to a ventricular tachycardia. Excellent job, everyone. So on top of it. Awesome. All right. Uh, I'll simply add in that the terminology we'll commonly use for these guys is a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia for actual VTAC, where the, everything looks the same. Oftentimes, this will literally take on the shape of kind of a shark tooth appearance, like these individually look like shark teeth that could tear into some flesh very easily as opposed to the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia we're seeing here where there's different shapes and or sizes to the QRS complexes in the torsad picture. And so we have monomorphic versus polymorphic, which is usually going to be one of the differentiators we'll use to determine whether or not we're in regular style VTAC or we have something else happening like torsad. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at another uh, example here. Uh, so taking a look at like ventricular tachycardia versus V-fib on the other hand, uh, Moses, you want to try to distinguish like how we would tell the difference between these guys? Maybe yeah, and this just mentioned this can this can be difficult, and that's why we we put it here. Both are wide complex. Both can be very clinically significant. What I really want to point out here is ventricular fibrillation is disorganized. There's no clear pattern, right? Um, it's sort of a, a bag of worms. I think of it as the the afib of the ventricles, essentially. Um, Whereas ventricular tachycardia, you can definitely see a pattern here, particularly in monomorphic VTAC. It's described more as a sawtooth morphology, right? Folks have probably heard that. Um, so we wanted to put these side by side just to make clear what the, the differences are. Now, I'm the first to admit, if you have a really weird looking polymorphic uh, VTAC, could there be a moment of hesitation there regarding which one it is? But I wanna reassure everyone, a test is not gonna give you something that is totally uh, uninterpretable. It'll be, you know, a VTAC that, that looks like VTAC or it'll be VFib that's very clearly VFib. I would not spend a lot of time worrying about the ability to distinguish between the two beyond what is on this slide. All right, excellent. So I'll pick it up from here as we look at our next example. And so following the criteria that Moses had laid out, one thing I wanna know as soon as I'm looking at what I believe to be an arrhythmia, is whether or not we have a narrow complex or a wide complex. So everybody in chat, are we looking at a narrow complex or a wide complex here for the QRS complexes? Good, excellent. Lots of good answers coming in. Thanks guys. Appreciate you guys participating and playing along here. So we have a lot of people saying narrow. So if we look at the QRS complexes that we can clearly see here, it might be a little bit difficult to distinguish some of these guys and some of these leads, but I can look at QRS complexes in V2 and see them almost perfectly clearly, or maybe even V5, where they almost look like a straight line and say that's definitely smaller than three small boxes. I know we don't really have small box differentiation on this particular EKG, but nevertheless, we can make a qualitative judgment to say that these guys are most likely narrow. So if they're narrow, we know that we're probably not looking at a ventricular arrhythmia, we're looking more at a supraventricular arrhythmia. And I'll point out the next thing we usually want to know is it whether it is regular or whether it's not regular. And I would make the argument here that we're probably looking at a fairly regular problem as well, because there's a pretty even space between every QRS complex. So we have a regular supraventricular arrhythmia. And some people have already said the answer in chat, but we give you guys all a chance now. The thing that really pops out to us here, once we've identified kind of like the fact that we have this arrhythmia happening, we've taken a look at like the intervals here, is to look at the morphology. And the morphology here is pretty stunning to say the least. Based on the just general appearance here, anybody have any answer for what our actual diagnosis is? Let's go ahead and put it into the chat if you recognize this particular morphology. All right, good, we got some good answers coming in. 
So a couple of students saying that we've got a sawtooth appearance or that we have a supraventricular tachycardia. And that is likely true. In particular though, because we have this kind of like jagged appearance to the baseline, most likely what we're seeing is a flutter. So most likely this is an atrial flutter that we're seeing here. And the reason we would say that is because each of these individual sawtooths most likely represents a gigantic P wave, essentially, electrical activity circulating around the atria, and then all of those electrical signals penetrating down to the ventricles. Now, we would say this is called a four to one block. And the reason for that is because we can see that we have one, two, three jagged P waves before our QRS complex. But I would assume that we didn't stop doing the like atrial depolarizations that we're seeing here just because we had a ventricular depolarization, there's likely another one hidden behind here. And so we would say there's one, two, three, four atrial depolarizations for every one ventricular depolarization. Hence, even though I only see three sawtooths, I nevertheless call it a four to one block where there are four atrial depolarizations for every ventricular depolarization. Uh, Moses, anything to add there for identifying a flutter here? No, I think you said that really nicely. The point of confusion that comes up again and again is why is it four to one over three to one? I think you did a really great job. The mental image that I paint in my head is an electrical circuit going around the tricuspid annulus, and that's going nonstop 24 seven as long as this rhythm is going. Most of those depo atrial depolarizations, the AV node is like, a, you know, it's like a policeman at a stop sign. They're saying, stop, this, this depolarization is not going through. But occasionally, it lets one through. And occasionally, in this case, it's regularly. At every fourth one, it, the one gets through. So that's why it's four to one. Because it's not like when you have that QRS complex, the atria just stop all electrical activity. And then immediately after the QRS complex, it kicks up again with this pattern. That pattern is going on constantly. It's just that the fourth one is masked behind the QRS complex. So just another way of thinking about it. Awesome. Excellently stated. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into another example here. Moses, you want to kind of take us through this practice question? Absolutely. And the reason I think this one's a really good practice uh, problem for us to do together with, uh, with all the participants is because even though in this particular EKG, there is not tachycardia. If you do the, you know, the, the boxes by uh, method, it's not technically a tachycardia, but the arrows are pointing to is an abnormality in the PR interval. And I, I sort of planted a seed for this earlier in the webinar, and I already saw someone put it in the chat. So everyone else, feel free to jump in on this one. What, what are these arrows pointing to? Yes, yeah, just a, a, a wave of WPW coming through in the chat. And the reason this is really important is because um, you want to avoid AV nodal blocking agents in folks with Wolf, Parkinson's, and White who have tachycardia, right? So here's the teaching point. In the chat, what medication would you use in this patient if, if you needed to control their, their rate? And I'm already seeing one correct answer. Yes, it's procainamide. It's not metoprolol, right? It's not carvedilol you want to really avoid those AV nodal blocking agents and go for procainamide. And if you're not using procainamide, just, just go to cardioversion, right? If you really need it uh, clinically, but the, what will be tested is procainamide. That's the, the key teaching point for this, uh, for this slide. Awesome. Well stated. That's uh, exactly where I was going to go next was the therapy there. So this is one of those ones that we simply have to memorize is that the therapy for Wolf Parkinson White is procainamide. Uh, they really like to select that as the best answer, and, but what we have to avoid, like Moses had indicated, was any nodal blocking agents, any class two, class four antiarrhythmics, adenosine, for instance, real bad thing to utilize unless you are literally in an electrophysiology suite. So as a result, this is one of those kind of weird associations or exceptions that makes the rule when it comes to therapy. Now for step one, they're unlikely to ask about pharmacological therapy, but this is something that shows up on step two uh, as a particular uh, question. And we have one student kind of asking here like where the slur is located. So I'm gonna to try to highlight this even more clearly if possible. The slur is gonna be this kind of like diagonal shape that we have before the QRS complex. Under normal circumstances, the QRS complex is just going to start up. Whereas when we have Wolf Parkinson White, we usually have this kind of diagonal appearance first, which is called ventricular pre-excitation that occurs. So basically anything in this area here where we have anything going up that's happening too early, 
And that's because the bundle of Kent is allowing electrical activity to sneak into the ventricle without going through the AV node. And the AV node is always acting as kind of our policeman at the center of the heart, slowing down traffic so as to allow for adequate ventricular filling during diastole. We don't have any such policeman in the bundle of Kent. And so we have electrical activity rushing down into the ventricles too early, causing slightly earlier depolarization. Now, if we're very unfortunate, we can end up developing a tachycardia situation because we can allow electrical activity to float back through the bundle of Kent. And now we have a reentrant circuit where electricity is just chasing its own tail in the heart. And that's how we end up getting the arrhythmia that we're concerned about here. And that's where you'll typically have like a teenager coming in after exercising, saying they passed out for the first time while exercising. The tachycardia they experienced allowed for ventricular pre-excitation to occur, which then allowed for the reentrant rhythm to happen. So with Wolf, Parkinson, White behind us, let's go ahead and pivot over to the other type of arrhythmia that we're going to anticipate seeing on the exam, which is bradyarrhythmia or a slow heart rate. Now, classically, the main types of bradyarrhythmia that you're going to see on the exam are going to end up being situations where the signal cannot easily penetrate through the AV node, and that is going to be called AV nodal block. Now, I want to point out there's a lot of different flavors of AV nodal block, and they like to ask you about every single one on the exam. So the easiest way to distinguish uh, these guys for me is to say, well, if I'm looking at first degree AV nodal block, the only thing that happens is I slow down conduction through the AV node. When is electrical activity in the AV node? During the PR interval. So if I have a slow AV node, the PR interval is now longer. The regular PR interval is 200 milliseconds or one big box. So anything that's greater than that indicates that we have AV nodal slowing or a minor injury to the AV node. What if the AV node gets even more injured to the point where some beats don't make it through the AV node? We drop some beats. If any beats are dropped, we are now in second degree AV nodal block. And second degree AV nodal block can either be predictable, where you can see the PR interval get longer and longer and longer before we finally have one that's too long and then the QRS complex disappears, in which case we're going to have kind of the winky block or the second degree type one or we can have unpredictable losses of QRS complexes or unpredictable blocked beats where we don't see it coming, but it's just spontaneously randomly, a P wave will not turn into a QRS complex. That's second degree type two. Finally, in third degree, the distinction is that every P wave doesn't make it down to the ventricles. There is no conduction through the AV node. The AV node is completely dead, it's gone. And so now the ventricles are bereft of any signal from the top part of the heart and are firing on their own and the atria are firing on their own. And so we have two completely asynchronous uh, ventricle atria firing separately because there's no conduction. So the big breakdown then is first degree, no dropped beats. Second degree, some dropped beats. Third degree, all dropped beats. And that's how we're gonna try to distinguish these guys when we see them on the actual exam. Want to point out that generally speaking, First degree, almost never going to have any symptoms from that because how can you really tell how long your PR interval is? There's no way I can tell how long mine is symptomatically. There's nothing wrong there. There's no missed heartbeats in that case. In second degree, you might have a person who experiences the symptoms of palpitations. Maybe occasionally they might be lightheaded under certain circumstances. And third degree is where you could actually have a syncopal episode because we miss enough beats or the heart's not able to pump fast enough because of that blocked bridge between the atrium and the ventricles that we end up having uh, too little cardiac output for our needs and then we end up passing out. Importantly, that third degree AV nodal block is kind of scary because the ventricles are firing on their own. When the ventricles are firing on their own, they can kind of get up to mischief and we can develop ventricular tachycardia and reentrant rhythms. And VTAC, that's scary. That could kill a person. That could be life-threatening. For that reason, we have to provide therapy to these individuals in the form of a pacemaker. And so you might ask yourself, well, if that's the case, why do I want a pacemaker for second degree type two? I'm not really super scared about dropping a beat here and there. The main reason is because second degree type two can spontaneously turn into third degree while a person is sitting on their couch at home, and then they could get VTAC from third degree, and then they could die. So we just give them a pacemaker out of precaution. If we have to remember what the therapy pattern is here, the easy answer is first two guys do nothing. Second two guys do a pacemaker. All right. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at an example here. And I'll apologize. Every EKG we're going to look at is a little bit blurry, but this one's kind of blurry. 
What I'd like for everybody to do here is to look at this one and on the basis of the rate, which is very slow, we can see that there is a huge number of big boxes between each beat. And I can literally count the beats, one, two, three, four, five, maybe six in the span of 10 seconds, which means that we're looking at like a heart rate in the 30s, which is insanely slow. We know we're looking at a bradyarrhythmia and I'm concerned about heart block. What kind of heart block is this? Can you guys give me the answer in the chat? What's our guess? I've got one guess in here, two guesses now. Let's keep them coming. Do your best to kind of assess what kind of problem we're looking at here. All right, I got a couple of different answers here and the answers range from Mobitz type one to third degree. So I'm happy to see that everybody's saying that we're definitely missing beats here, right? We definitely are not getting every P wave turning into a QRS complex. And I can verify that because there's a P wave here, there's a P wave there, and we don't get a QRS complex after them. Now the real difficult part here is second degree or third degree, and we're pretty split. I see pretty much even answers uh, between second degree and third degree. And so here's the rule of thumb I'm going to set forth. It's tempting to say that maybe this P wave turns into that QRS complex, or maybe this P wave turns into that QRS complex. It's really, really difficult to determine whether or not the QRS complexes are following the P waves. But let me ask you this. If you randomly drop beats, if you have a second degree heart block, whether it's second degree type one or second degree type two, if you randomly drop beats, is that regular or irregular? So for second degree heart block, I want everybody to say in the chat, is second degree heart block regular or irregular? Good, so everybody's saying, yeah, if it's randomly dropped beats, that's gotta be an irregular rhythm that we're seeing there. So second degree is irregular, right? Well, I want you guys to assess the R to R interval that we're seeing between all these QRS complexes. Now, my question is, is this EKG regular or irregular for the QRS complexes? All right, everybody's doing a great job of following along. You're picking up what I'm laying down. This is regular. If this is regular, that must mean the ventricles are totally in control of what they're doing on their own. They're not even listening to the P waves anymore. Because if they're listening to the P waves, they might every once in a while pick them up and then every once in a while not pick them up. If we have a second degree heart block, it's always irregular. If we have a third degree heart block, we go back to having a regular rhythm because the ventricles now decide their own fate slowly, but they still decide their own fate. And what you're going to end up seeing for the P waves, which is so insidious here, is that the P waves of the QRS complexes are going to every once in a while synchronize. Like you would see with two cars in front of you turning left at a stoplight, eventually the blinkers blink at the same time. Even though they have nothing to do with one another, they're still gonna look like they're associated every once in a while. That's what's happening with the asynchronous pace of the P waves and the QRS complexes in third degree heart block. But the way that we know that's third degree is that it's regular again. So that's how you're best going to distinguish second degree versus third degree heart block on these EKGs. It's by taking a look at whether or not we have regularity there. This is complete dissociation between the P waves and the QRS complexes. Anything to add to that, Moses? That, that was so beautifully said. Um, <laughs> Thanks, man. I, I couldn't have done it better myself. Uh, I think the other thing to note is that sometimes you see weirdness in the QRS complexes. Some look a little different than others. And that's because you have a superimposed P on top of a QRS. Um, will you see that every single time? No, but if you do see it and the, and the P's are marching out at their own rate and the ventricles, the QRS complexes are also going doing their own thing, big clue. Otherwise, nothing to add. All right, in that case, then I'll hand off another example over to you to walk us through. Perfect. Um, so again, you know, surprise, surprise, we're dealing with a Brady arrhythmia. Um, and the key, as is with the last problem, is to figure out what is going on with the Brady arrhythmia. And so I start by doing exactly what we did last time, looking at the piece 
looking at the QRS and asking what association, if any, do I see between the P's and the QRS? Because it's that pattern that will help us classify the bradyarrhythmia. So in this case, what I'm seeing is that every QRS has a P. Sometimes they're a little hard to, to, to distinguish, but every, every P has a QRS, every QRS has a P. So if that's true in the chat, what kind of bradyarrhythmia does this have to be, if that statement is true? Don't be shy. Beautiful, beautiful, yes. So what folks are pointing out, and we're getting lots of correct answers, is that it has to be sinus, right? That, that goes back to our definition of what sinus rhythm means. And we already decided that this is bradycardia, so this is a sinus bradycardia. And this is when we level up and think about the next thing. Well, okay, now that we've established a sinus, what's the quantitative relationship between the P and the QRS? And you can see that in a couple of these cases, the P looks sort of far away from the QRS complex. And if we were to zoom in and actually measure it out, you'd see that it would be more than um, the normal PR interval, right? 200 milliseconds. So that means this is both sinus bradycardia and first degree AV block. Feel free to put questions in the chat. These are complicated. The terminology get jumbled, Mobis type one, Mobis type two. We're here to demystify. Joe, anything else you would say in terms of teaching points here? No, you nailed it. Um, only to say that if we're ever confused about what counts as a long PR interval, one big box is what we're expecting for the PR interval, which is 200 milliseconds. So you can kind of compare, as I've tried to do with these lines down here, that the beginning of the P wave all the way over to the QRS is a little bit longer than the, a big box size on here, which tells us that we have that first degree AV nodal block on there. Um, so uh, as far as a couple questions that students are asking in the chat here, just to clarify for this question, what lead are we looking for? Like, where are we looking with the rhythm stuff? Generally speaking, the best place to look is at the bottom strip here. You'll notice that for the 12 leads on the EKG, each of them lasts for like two and a half seconds or so on here. They're all very short. Uh, whereas if you look at the bottom lead, you get to see one of those guys, in this case, lead V1, spread out over a full 10 seconds. That's usually the best place to look at for rhythm because it gives us a longer time interval to kind of like identify where weird stuff is happening. Now, what you've seen on previous EKGs that we've shown you tonight is that the rhythm strip, the bottom strip on there, isn't always V1. In fact, most commonly lead two is probably the one that's like our routine rhythm strip that we'll end up using. So what that means then is that when you get a question like this one, maybe it's the case that V1 is just better for viewing the stuff we're looking for. So they've helped us out by giving us a better, better uh, lead down there. That being said, multiple of the EKGs we've used tonight have had multiple rhythm strips. Like they've actually put lead two, lead V1, lead V5, all three of them as rhythm strips down there. So we can end up finding uh, that there's different rhythm strips at the bottom. Classically, they'll give you at least one to look at to better assess what the rate and rhythm is. If we didn't have that rhythm strip at the bottom, it would be difficult to assess the heart rate other than using the big box strategy that we discussed before, because we wouldn't be able to map out, say, lead three for 10 seconds because lead three ends at some point, and now we're looking at a different lead entirely after that. Um, okay, so a couple more questions coming in specifically about this rhythm strip. It's hard to see the P waves. Uh, that is true. I will point out that we're a little limited in our technological capacity here. On the exam, you can zoom in on the picture that they have for you for any of these EKGs. And so it would be easier to pinpoint this stuff. Um, in particular though, our P waves here for lead V1 are gonna be these little things that we're seeing that I'm highlighting here. I know that they are not the easiest thing to see in the world and they are mostly inverted here. And you might argue that, hey, it would have been nice if they gave us lead two, or we can clearly see nice P waves. Yeah, that's true. But they chose to give us, give us lead V1. And ostensibly, it is easier somehow to see that. And that's why they did that for us. OK, uh, now that we've run through our characteristic examples of what we would want to do, 
uh, for some of these big picture EKGs. I want to run through some like rapid fire examples with you guys to see if we can't deploy some of the knowledge we've learned tonight for various examples of routine EKGs they ask on there. Um, one more question somebody asked, how do you manage this? The answer for bradycardia on the exam is always atropine. Not as dangerous as using sympathetic stimulation. If you block parasympathetics, you still speed up the heart, but you don't have to mess with blood vessels by doing that. So using atropine is the best answer for sinus bradycardia on the exam, mainly for level two and step two. All right, so some quick rhythm strips, some quick examples. Let's jump into it. Uh, first example I've got here, I'm going to point out this is like this is just a rhythm strip, by the way, which is commonly how your questions are going to be on the exam. They didn't even tell us what kind of rhythm strip we're looking at. They didn't tell me what lead this is. So all I can do is really assess the rate and rhythm. And we can see there's about two big boxes between each QRS complex, and this is fairly regular. So can anybody tell me, first of all, what's the heart rate roughly on here? So numerically, what are we going to calculate to be our heart rate for this strip? Perfectly calculated so far for everybody that's answered. Excellent. So 300 divided by the number of big boxes between each R wave. So 300 divided by two, 150. So this is definitely tachycardia. Next question we want to ask, is this a sinus rhythm? So yes or no, is this sinus? All right, good. So everybody's saying this is sinus and it's fast. So it's sinus tachycardia, which actually isn't necessarily an arrhythmia so far as we don't have irregularity here, but it is a fast heart rate that we'd have to pay attention to. So that is literally our answer in this case. This is somebody who is excited, amped up, maybe hypovolemic, uh, maybe hyperthyroid. Who's to say? Many different reasons to have sinus tachycardia, but all we can really assess from the CKG is sinus and fast tachycardia. Very nice. All right, Moses, you want to lead us through another uh, characteristic example here? Let's do it. So again, here um, we're looking at the rate. And first of all, we noticed that if we used uh, 300 divided by big boxes, we would get wildly different answers depending on which uh, two QRS complexes we decide to focus on. That's a clue to what this ultimately will be. But regardless, there are uh, intervals here where the number of big boxes is less than three. And I use that as a dividing point because 300 divided by three is 100. So if it's less than three boxes, it's a tachycardia of some kind. And I can use fancier methods to nail down the exact rate. Um, for instance, if I had a full 10 second uh, rhythm strip. Um, so next in the chat, we decide as tachycardia, is this a regular or irregular? And I already sort of teased this. It's irregular. Do I see any clear P waves? Yes or no, chat? Help me out. I agree. I'm having a lot of trouble. There's a, sort of a bag of worms appearance here. And so I, folks have already been putting the right answer in the chat. What is the most common tachycardia that's irregular, marrow complex, atrial fibrillation. Perfect. Nailed it. So bonus question then, what's going on on this bottom picture? Uh, extra question we've layered on top of this one. Can anybody guess what we're trying to indicate, especially with those arrows on this bottom strip here? And while folks are thinking, ooh, I already, see, I already see a couple of correct answers. The key is that we actually do see P waves, but they differ in morphology. So this is multifocal atrial tachycardia. Beautiful. And irregularly irregular tachy narrow complex tachycardia. Awesome. And again, as Moses indicated, the difference here is even though it's irregularly irregular, we can still see that there are P waves, but all the P waves look different from one another which means that we just have multiple ectopic foci of RP waves as opposed to completely chaotic electrical activity that we would be seeing in atrial fibrillation. All right, let's take a look at another example here. Uh, so our next question, first thing I'll ask is, is this regular? All right, thanks everybody for put in our answers here. So I'm getting no irregular in no way. So good answers. So this is not regular. This is irregular. 
Is this a tachycardic arrhythmia or bradycardic arrhythmia? Excellent. So great job answering this because here it's really hard to just use our default rules. We don't have a 10 second rhythm strip, nor do we have the capacity to use the big box method. But even at our fastest beats, the big box method shows there's about five big boxes between these guys. And so we definitely are going to rate this lower than 60. So we have a bradycardic problem. And like we had talked about before, the most common bradycardias we're going to see here are heart blocks. So then the final question I have for you guys, is this sinus or is this not sinus? Hmm, I have some disagreement with the students now. Some people saying two different things. Remember, sinus rhythm means P wave for every QRS complex and QRS complex for every P wave. I see a P wave here and I see a P wave here that are not accompanied by a QRS complex. I'll also point out, you cannot have an irregular sinus rhythm. That would be not typical. If you have a sinus rhythm, regularity is kind of baked in. So by asking if it was irregular in the first place, I kind of gave you the lead on this by showing that it's almost certainly not sinus. So we have some P waves that are not conducted and we have other P waves that are conducted. So what kind of heart block are we looking at here? What's our actual diagnosis? See some people saying second degree, but remember there's second degree type one, second degree type two, and there is no second degree type three. That's third degree, if that's what you're trying to say with your answers there. So I'm seeing a couple different answers. Most people saying second degree type two, and you are correct with second degree type two, because if it were third degree, remember the ventricles are autonomous now, and we have a regular rhythm with third degree. So it can't be that. With first degree heart block, we have no dropped beats, but I clearly see dropped beats, so it can't be that. For second degree heart block, we either have a predictable prolongation of the PR interval that happens every beat until we lose a beat, or we have randomly dropped beats. And if I look at the PR interval for our first couple noticeable beats here, the PR interval looks totally normal. And then spontaneously, we dropped a beat. And then again, we dropped another beat right away. That almost never happens in second degree type one. So we can kind of close the book on this one and say that we're looking at second degree type two. All right. So the way we approach this one is by saying first, is it regular or not? Is it tachycardic or bradycardic? And then with the regular question, we can ask, is it sinus? If it's not sinus, if it's a bradyarrhythmia, we should start paying attention to the possibility for heart block and then ask, are some dro beats dropped? Are all beats dropped? And that can help us to determine whether we're looking at second degree or third degree. Awesome job, everybody. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at another example. Moses, you're up for this one. Perfect. So first question for the chat, um, is this, what is the rate? Fast, slow, normal? Y'all are so good. Jumped right ahead. Fast, agree. QRS wide or narrow? It's wide, perfect. And then we look at the morphology, right? We're not seeing any clear P waves. It's wide. Monomorphic folks are saying everyone's really right on the right track. This is ventricular tachycardia, monomorphic. So common causes ischemia, electrolyte abnormalities, dilated uh, uh, cardiomyopathies, as well as uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. Beautiful, beautiful. And again, note that the big box, there's just about two big boxes between each QRS. So just by looking at that, it's under three, it has to be fast. Beautiful, all right. We're starting to slam dunk these things. And I'm gonna go even faster for our next one because this one is a pathognomonic finding. You see this and we now have to kind of instantaneously recognize what we're looking at here. What is our answer? Or we can just type into the chat, nailing it. Got multiple people saying the right answer here. Very good, awesome answers. I've seen some people say four to one, a atrial flutter that we're seeing, like we looked at before. Same idea, four to one block, where I can see three P waves followed by one QRS complex. Presumptively, there's another P wave hiding behind that QRS complex, in which case we'd say there's one, two, three visible P waves, one invisible P wave. That's four P waves per QRS complex. So 
excellent job. As soon as you see this sawtooth pattern to the baseline, that's always going to be a flutter every time you see it on the exam. So this is one of those ones that's just like a buzzword in picture form, a buzz picture, if you will, in terms of what you're going to end up seeing on the real exam. All right, Moses, I'm going to toss over to you for our next here. Perfect. So similar regimented organized approach. Is this fast or is this slow? Chat, what do you think? I agree. It's somewhere between, it's like five, uh, five big boxes. So we're looking at a bradycardia. And when you hear bradycardia, the next question you ask is, what are the P waves doing compared to what are the QRSs? Uh, what are the QRSs doing? But before that, again, that was just the framework. I want to go back to what Joe brilliantly taught us. Does this, I mean, we, we're getting a snapshot here, but does this look regular or irregular to folks? If you march it out, there's a little bit of irregularity, but it looks surprisingly regular to me as far as the QRSs are concerned. The length there is like pretty regular-ish. That one that he's drawing may be a little bit slower, but still fairly regular. Now look at the P waves. If we mark out the P waves, they come out also at a regular interval. Some of them are sort of sneakily tacked on to the end of a QRS or to the beginning or middle of a QRS. And the morphology of the QRS changes a little bit, which I mentioned earlier. So if we have a bradycardia, it is regular. The P waves are marching out, but the rate of the P waves is different than the rate of the QRSs, right? And we don't have a one-to-one -one ratio there. We're talking about, and folks have already been blowing up the chat with this, third degree AV block. I am so proud of everyone in the chat. This is super hard. One of the most difficult arrhythmias uh, to, to get right. And you all just knocked it right out of the park. Thanks to, to Joe's great teaching. Thanks, man. Excellent job yourself walking them through this stuff. So you guys have been nailing our examples, just crushing them with good answers. So thank you very much for answering, uh, playing along with us as we're going through this. I want to try to summarize what we've been looking at so far with our examples and with like our big teaching points tonight. Basic idea here when we're looking at our EKGs is that we should always attempt to our best ability to utilize our five steps. Try your best to measure the rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, and morphology. You'll find that in many cases, things like axis tend to fall out and not be very important for some of the questions that we're asking on the exam. But we know that that is a tool we have in our tool belt if it is necessary, if we suspect there is some kind of axis deviation on the EKG. Try your best to run through as many of these as you can in an organized, regimented way when you're going through the questions. Keeping in mind that sometimes it's impossible to use some of these things based on the type of EKG that they give you. Um, as far as you know, the types of problems that we can identify in the EKG, we should always be looking for tachyarrhythmia versus bradyarrhythmia. Is it fast or slow? If it's fast, we want to know, is it the atria controlling the, the problem? Is this a narrow complex tachycardia that we're seeing here where the atria are telling the ventricles to go too fast? That's narrow complex. Is this a ventricular problem where the ventricles are firing too fast on their own, independent of the atria, in which case we'd say it's a ventricular problem, and we can proceed from there. For bradyarrhythmias, Classically, the biggest ones we're going to end up running into are going to be the heart blocks and identifying first degree, second degree, and third degree really comes down to identifying, are we dropping some beats? Are we dropping no beats? Are we dropping all of the beats? And is this regular or irregular? But most importantly, even though we've been directly tackling these DKGs a lot tonight to really hone our skills with reading them, keep in mind that overall on the questions you're seeing on the exam, EKGs are best utilized as a testing tool insofar as you should generally get a sense of what the problem might be. And then you look at the EKG to help confirm, is that what I think it should be happening here? And if you don't find the thing you're looking for, then you may reevaluate your steps and say, well, actually what I see on the EKG is ST segment elevations. I was thinking I was gonna see like, you know, maybe a heart block or something, but now I can clearly see there's ST segment elevations. So maybe I gotta rethink my clinical diagnosis on this one. So you're testing what you thought you saw in the clinical vignette in many cases. We don't always want to jump into the EKG completely blind. We're always going to correlate clinically with these things. Um, anything to add for like just our overall learning points, Moses? That was great. Thanks. All right. So 
we're going to try to stick around and answer any big picture questions you guys have about EKGs or reading EKGs. So if there's anything that was still confusing about what we discussed tonight, uh, please feel free to send those questions into the chat box now as you guys are sending those questions in. I'm just going to give you a little bit more background information as we're kind of collecting your questions uh, about med school tutors and who we are, what our usual service is. So to reiterate what I said at the beginning of our meeting this evening, Med School Tutors is a one-to-one -one tutoring service, and our primary goal is to really act as mentors for the students that we're working with. Uh, generally speaking, that means, you know, pairing tutors with students to work on a one-on-one -on -one basis, classically to best prepare you for a major exam, and that could be step one, that could be coursework exams leading up to step one, clinical shelf exams, step two, step three, and even beyond. We have residents and attendings on our staff to help with basically anything from the beginning of medical school through residency when it comes to exam preparation, but then also for residency application advisement and things of that nature as well. We're really here to help out in any way we can. If there's any way that an individual tutor mentor can help you to achieve your goals in medical school and beyond. I will point out, we also do pre-medical stuff as well. I'm assuming most people here are already in medical school if you're talking about EKGs and everything. So that being said, tell your friends, we like to help everybody from beginning to end when it comes to applying to medical school to getting through uh, residency. Uh, generally speaking, as we work with individuals, we meet one-on-one -on -one over a camera like this on Zoom to help teach about specific material for an exam, talk about preparing applications, things of that, of that nature. As I work with students, I typically will develop a study schedule for them to tell them exactly what they should be doing with their own independent time to prepare for exams, communicate back and forth with emails, telephone calls, in addition to the on-camera sessions that I hold with students. Uh, and in many cases, I stick together with students and work with them long term, even after finishing the big exam we were ostensibly paired for, I still communicate with a lot of students that I work with over weeks, months, and even years after finishing with them since I've been with the company for a while now. Uh, and it always is really nice to just get updates from students, but also questions about how they can best proceed as they continue forward in their career, uh, always happy to kind of be a source of advice for them. So what we're really trying to do here is develop a mentorship program for anybody who's involved in medical education. And so if you have any kind of need in that regard, please feel free to reach out to us. Our communication information is on the bottom of this slide. I'll bring it up on the main slide in just a minute here, but we'd love to help you with anything that comes to medical education in general. Um, if you're not necessarily totally ready to jump in for a long-term relationship as I described, we also do one-time counseling sessions for students. So if there is anything that we can help you with, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to connect with you. So with that being said, we're gonna try to answer questions that you've got uh, about anything we talked about this evening. Um, Moses, anything you've seen kind of pop up in the chat while I've been speaking here that seems uh, broadly generalizable, something we didn't explain totally correctly this evening or totally thoroughly? I've been responding to most folks uh, in the chat. Uh, so thanks for uh, dropping all of those questions. Um, I think what came up more was talking a little bit about the rate. I just, I, maybe everyone would find this useful. I'll, I'll be brief. The important thing, big picture, is knowing is the rate fast, is it normal, or is it slow, right? Because that determines your differential and what you're looking for on the EKG. Sometimes um, knowing the exact rate can be useful, right? Because, for instance, a flutter um, or even certain types of ventricular tachycardias, they tend to live in certain ranges of tachycardia, but that's not really relevant for step one or step two. That's, that's uh, further down the line. For you, be able to confidently tell if a rate is fast, normal, or slow, and then use the schemas that we talked about. If it's slow, think about regular, irregular, what is the relationship with the P's, the QRS isn't dropped, is it, if it's fast, wide versus narrow. And I think with that, you'll get 99, if not 100% of the questions that come your way. And I should also say that if uh, there are folk, uh, questions that came up while we were chatting and we didn't get to it in the chat or in our conversation, please just repost it now so that we can um, so that we can get to it. There was one that I remember from a little while back that asked about why there was left axis deviation of, in left bundle branch block. That's sort of complicated. Joe, I actually found an image that might be useful for me to pop up. Would it be okay if I, if I share? Absolutely. Okay, let me... Let me find it. Uh, Life in the Fast Lane is a phenomenal um, is a phenomenal website for all things EKG. I'll be I'll be brief about this. The point here is that in a normal heart, the summed vector of all these electrical signals is roughly in this direction. I'm I'm sort of pointing it with my with my mouse here. But but in a left bundle branch block, the the electrical signal 
because it's blocked, doesn't go down the left and, and start the depolarization on the left side. So the sequence of events, and you can see that in the text below here, is that it starts up in the atria, goes through the AV node, it, de it depolarizes the right side first, and then from the right side, it goes towards the left. And it is that leftward um, depolarization that is abnormal that shifts the um, axis from being more in this direction upwards. And if it's severe enough, it'll, it'll land you in the left axis deviation. Joe, anything to add? Does that, does that explanation make sense? That sounds perfect. That's exactly what I would have said. Excellent answer there. All righty. I'll go ahead and pull back up our screen here. Um, one question I had seen from earlier on as well uh, was asking about how you would identify kind of a pseudo ST elevation versus an actual ST elevation. So like, when does it count as like myocardial ischemia? And the classical way that you're gonna end up seeing this shown uh, is that when you have your QRS complex and you have your ST uh, or your T wave afterwards, if you have kind of a concave appearance here where the T wave comes up and it's kind of scooped out in appearance there, that usually represents a non-real ST segment elevation, meaning it doesn't usually represent the fact that we actually have uh, some kind of ischemia to the heart. If, however, you have a QRS complex where afterwards you have kind of a convex shape to the T wave, where it almost literally looks like a tombstone, that is when you have real ST segment elevations. I will point out that this is a fairly obscure thing for exams. It's unlikely for them to give you an ST segment elevation that would be classified as a pseudo ST elevation on the real test. You might see this clinically, you might be asked about this clinically, but on the exam, if you see an ST segment elevation, I would tend to treat it as a real finding. That being said, uh, I do wanna emphasize that ST segment elevations do happen for th three separate reasons on the USMLE or level exams. The first one is the one we've discussed, which is current myocardial ischemia and myocardial infarction. However, myocardial infarctions are usually limited to specific leads on the EKG. And if you find that every lead on the EKG has ST segment elevations, that usually is not a heart attack because it would be strange to see a heart attack in literally every artery on the heart at the same time. So instead, we would say an excellent answer from somebody in the chat, <laughs> pericarditis is usually what we see for pan ST elevations or diffuse ST elevations on the EKG. So myocardial infarction, localized ST segment elevations, uh, pericarditis, global ST segment elevations. On the other hand, the final thing that can cause ST segment elevations is if you have a ventricular aneurysm, if scar tissue forms in the area where the heart attack occurred, and now that area is paradoxically moving the wrong direction with every heartbeat because it's no longer muscular tissue, it's now scar tissue, you're going to find that the ST segment elevations from the original heart attack persist forever in these patients. And so what you might find when a patient comes into clinic, you might see ST segment elevations in the same place they just had a heart attack three months ago, and they're sitting there talking with you totally normal, normal vital signs and everything. And without freaking out and sending them to the ER immediately for a cardiac catheterization, you might recall, oh, right, if they have ventricular aneurysm, which might not be particularly symptomatic, they could have ST segment elevations that persist. So ventricular aneurysm, pericarditis, and myocardial ischemia are the big three for ST segment elevations. I would anticipate that they would be real if you were to see them on the exam and not pseudo ST elevations. I will count Prinz metal's angina as being a form of myocardial ischemia. So that technically falls into my purview, but yes, you can end up seeing ST segment elevations in Prinz metals as well. Uh, very astute observation there by one of our uh, students in the audience there. Uh, any other questions you're seeing there, Moses, that uh, we might wanna answer before we close out tonight? I'm not seeing anything else. Last call for questions. As you guys are thinking about anything last minute on your mind there, I'll remind you, you could fill out the survey that we sent a link to at the start of our session this evening. Really appreciate to get any feedback from you guys. Anything that we can do to make this more informative, more effective, uh, it takes less time than the time it takes to answer one UO question to fill it out, like 30 seconds, 20 seconds, really would help us to kind of get your feedback on how things went this evening. Um, Final question here that I see, ST segment changes in unstable angina. It is true, you will see some ST segment changes in unstable angina 
as well, I will classify that as ischemia. So ischemic changes to the heart will include ST segment changes, uh, including unstable angina or Prinz metals angina in, in full STMI or STEMI. Uh, but those are all going to fall under the same purview as ischemia to the heart. All right, everybody. I uh, want to thank you for showing up this evening and listen to us chatter on about EKGs. Uh, Moses, any last minute things to say to our students before we close out tonight? No, I just want to thank you all for being so active in the chat. Active participation leads to increased knowledge retention. We really appreciate your participation and we wish you the best of luck with any exams or rotations that might be coming up for you all. Um, just fingers crossed. Yeah, thanks for showing up, everybody. We really appreciate your participation and for hanging in there with us. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all in the next webinar we hold. Otherwise, best of luck on your exams and good luck on the wards.